and I'm going to have to stop this for a second. So we're going to talk about year-round stewardship. And I have to like this, you know, working for an abundant harvest. What is year-round stewardship? And so I want to do a quick poll. So put the answers in the chat, if you will. When you request pledges, most congregations do that in the fall. There might be one that does it in the spring. But when, when your congregation requests pledges, what do you call that request? What do you call that process? So if you put your, your answers in the chat, that'd be great. With my screen sharing, I can't see the chat. So I'm gonna ask Caroline to monitor the chat and I just sort of call out what people call that. Pledge drive, financial commitments for mission and ministry, pledge drive, mm -hmm. estimate of giving, annual giving, Stewardship campaign, pledge campaign, stewardship campaign. Time and talent survey. Great. Estimate. So, you know, and, and a variety of answers. A lot of them pledge or annual giving or stewardship giving or so a variety of things in there. So let, let's back up for a second and think about a, the three budget approach to congregational finances. And I could have done four, but I had a diagram with three. I like three. God is Trinity and unity. So three is good. And one is the operating budget. And operations is the day-to-day -day running of the congregation. If you do something all the time, that's operations. So the light bill, the water bill, depending on what whether you do it all the time. So if you have staff salary or buildings or um, those things that you do all the time, every year, year in, year out, uh, to run your congregation, that's operations. Capital reserves. We usually think that about this in terms of putting in a reserve fund for the building. It doesn't have to be, but that's usually how we talk about it. Capital reserves are putting money away for things that happen. So for instance, I'm going to have to paint my house this year, the outside of my house. I knew I was going to have to paint my house at some point in time. I've been putting money away into reserves for the fact I'm going to have to paint my house. When I first moved into the house, I needed a new furnace. Right? Fortunately, at that point in time, it was a buyer's market and the seller uh, purchased a year guarantee on everything. And so that guarantee paid for the furnace. But I know now when that furnace was purchased, I know the life of that furnace and I put money away in a reserve fund so that when I have to replace the furnace, the money is there. We highly recommend every congregation put 2% of your annual budget into a capital reserve fund every year because you know for a fact at one some point in time the furnace is going to die the water heater will stop working the roof will need to be replaced some window will break something is going to happen and what i find is that most congregations do not do this and then they scramble when something happens budgeting for capital reserves every year makes a lot of sense and then there's investments and or designated funds. And in the little um, diagram, I just put investments. This might be endowments. It might be in just um, investment income. It might be that you have designated funds for things such as um, a youth mission trip or um, a, a particular outreach ministry, but it's designated. It's not from, it's not the normal operations of the church. It's above and beyond the normal operations of the church. Your investment income might also give you, like if you have an endowment, you might take a percentage of that to go into the operating budget, but it's not the whole thing, okay? So this is a way to think about all of your finances. Where do they go? Is it the normal day-to-day -day operations of the church? Is it designated and or investment? 
piece of capital reserves. But the thing is, your annual giving campaign, however you call it, whatever you call it, that is about your operating budget, right? Your annual giving campaign, your pledge drive, your whatever you call it, is about your operating budget. But year-round stewardship is more than a giving campaign. It's, it's way more than just a giving campaign. So we're thinking about year-round stewardship. What are some roadblocks? If you think it's all about money, that's going to be a challenge. But at the same time, if you don't want to think about money, that's a challenge. Or if you think money is a private thing, I mean, we have this a lot in the church, but we also have it in other places where money is private. We don't talk about it. I often hear um, what I give is between me and God. You know, my money is private. Um, being uncomfortable with talking about money. And, and I see this often when people feel uncomfortable about their own sense of their relationship with money, right? Or their sense, sometimes people have a bit of shame around their own finances and their own life with money. And so they are really uncomfortable talking about it with others. Not having a steward's mindset. We're gonna talk about you around stewardship. You need to think about what's the steward's mindset. Having no sense of stewardship other than asking for money will be a roadblock. And then not paying attention to what are the financial real realities of the community and the financial realities of different generations. This will also be a roadblock to good year-round stewardship. And also year-round stewardship will not work if what you do is you put together a committee in September on the annual giving campaign and that's all you do it will not work if you send out the same letters last year or one that's very very similar if you never talk stewardship outside of the fall and you use the steward word stewardship only with respect to giving to the annual budget if you're highly anxious about the budget and most importantly if no one can even define what stewardship is you're on stewardship won't work So what is stewardship? I, I have this in quotes because I know somebody said it, but I don't know who, right? But this is a quote I've heard a lot and I wish I, I knew who to attribute it to. Everything we do, with everything we have, once we say we believe. So everything we do with everything we have, once we say we believe. Or work with our time, talent and treasure on behalf of the owner, which implies that we're not the owner. Stewardship is a complete way of thinking and acting. So stewardship is a much, much bigger word than simply pledging or annual giving. One person says that quote is from Charles Stoughton. So. Okay. I don't know who Charles Stoughton is, um, but I like the quote. All right, so stewardship is a way of life. This is what I really want to, to get at. A stewardship is actually a way of life. Year-round stewardship in this context is the formation of disciples of Jesus Christ who follow Jesus and everything they do with everything they have. Following Jesus with everything we do and everything we have. So it is about money. And... It is about worship, and it's about our study, our deepening formation, and it's about our action. It's fundamentally about discipleship, about being a disciple of Jesus Christ. So let's talk a little bit about the process of discipleship for a steward's way of life. And if we think about the action that a congregation does, and then the reason sort of behind that action, so, and I'm gonna use language that we're familiar with in this diocese of gather and transform and send. So an action to gather the people of God into the congregation. And the reason for that is we come, we're invited and we're, we form connections. 
transform is all about growth in discipleship, growth in becoming the people of God who God has invited us to be. And then we're sent out to be disciples in all areas of our life, our family life, our work life, our congregational life, um, wherever we are in all areas of our life, God sends us out. And so through invitation and connection, through growth and discipleship, through being disciples in all areas of our life, there's a process here for sort of a steward's way of life. And remember, a steward is one that, that we are called to be followers of Jesus Christ with everything that we have in all areas of our life. Okay, so I want to focus a little bit the dynamics of discipleship and giving. And if the focus of, of year-round stewardship is on discipleship, what people have found is that giving goes up. The increase the focus on discipleship leads to an increased response in terms of giving. Now, when we go through some of these slides, I don't want to imply that we do this simply to get more money, right? This is not this is not about targeting discipleship so we get more money. This is um, people have discovered that when the focus is on discipleship, giving goes up in the congregation. When the focus is on giving, the response in terms of engagement and discipleship goes down, and giving goes down. Now, there's some nuances here. So let me unpack this a little bit. I don't want to say that being clear about giving and the need to give and how to give and the, the request for money leads to a lowered amount of giving, right? I want to, What I want to really focus on is what is the primary focus for that call, for that request, for that invitation? If the primary focus is you need to give money, then usually giving goes down, right, overall. And, and, and I don't mean to say that every single year that, that there's not a time when if, if you've never been explicit in asking, you might get an increase, right, if they've never actually heard you explicitly ask them to give. But what's the primary reason? The primary reason in your focus is on giving, um, then what people see across the board is that actually engagement goes down and giving will go down. So the focus on discipleship, it goes up. Focus on giving is more problematic. And, and again, there's some nuances there. If you've never talked about giving, if you've never been explicit about people um, being invited to consider giving financially and with their time and with their talent, um, you, you can see a bump, but it's why do we do this? All right, so if the focus is on we're highly anxious because we might die, um, we don't have enough money, we, we need to just keep doing what we're doing, um, there's not enough people. If, the, if there's this energy and that focus that's around anxiety and maintaining the church, <coughs> we don't have enough, again, what we see is that engagement goes down and giving goes down. On the other hand, when the focus is on a clear sense of mission and vision, a clear sense that God um, blesses us abundantly and that we call to be generous in response, um, then we see an increase in engagement and an increase in giving. And we'll, um, by the way, we'll send these slides out as well. So how do you build an engaged congregation of stewards? One of the critical things is non-anxious leadership. And these are three quotes that I've seen that I really like. And I, I, if I knew who to attribute them, I would. But I actually don't know who said them first. So sorry about that. Um, but I love the fact that the danger is real, but fear is a choice. And so, for instance, in our world today, in our congregations today, um, the reality is we live in a time when many people are no longer choosing to be participating in faith communities, when there's increased inflation, when people are worried about finances. So the, the, the question in, certain, in terms of 
how do we approach that? We're going to be non-anxious. We have to remember that fear is a choice. We don't have to be afraid. In fact, almost every time the angels show up in scripture, they say, do not be afraid. That's one of the first things they say. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Because fear, fear will paralyze us. And fear will lead us to focus on anxiety and scarcity. And remember, when we focus in on anxiety and scarcity, then everything, actually, it's counterproductive. I love this quote about if you want to teach people how to drive, you have to learn how to flinch on the inside. <laughs> right? So helping people engage in the life of discipleship, um, you, there, people are going to make mistakes. They're going to do things that, that um, lead you to want to flinch. And how do you be that non-anxious leadership in the congregation and, and in the community? And then be the change you wish to see. If, if you're trying to invite people into a life of stewardship, you need to be living a life of stewardship. So if it's about discipleship, then there's some really important things we need to think about. How are we doing faith formation? We're inviting people to grow in their life in Jesus. How are we doing that? How are we having vibrant worship? Right? Um, worship needs to be something that is vibrant and life-giving. Are we engaged in strong outreach, reaching outside beyond ourselves? And then here's one that I think other congregations, frankly, do a better job of than most Episcopal congregations. How do we give people financial tools for their own life? And it goes back to a lot of reasons why year round stewardship won't work if we're uncomfortable talking about money, if we feel like money is a private thing, if we don't ever talk about money other than when we give, how do we give people financial tools for their own life? People are in debt. People don't necessarily know if they can um, pay their bills. Younger people in particular are looking at huge amounts of either student loan debt or they can't afford to buy a house. More and more people are living in either together in apartments or staying in their parents' house. How do we help people with financial tools for their own life? And the key here is you don't have to know everything, right? There are really good tools out there where you can bring programs into a congregation where people can actually talk about how to gain control over their own financial life. But if we don't ever talk about the reality of people's financial lives, then we're, we're continuing to keep money as its own separate mysterious thing that becomes a hold over us. It becomes an idol in many ways. So how do we really think about this? And this is something I very seldom see any Episcopal congregation take seriously. So I invite you to really think about that one. And then you need financial and fiduciary transparency. I, uh, I heard this in terms of what is a budget that a 12-year-old could read and understand? I certainly have seen budgets that a 12-year-old cannot read or understand. And now we're going to assume a relatively intelligent 12-year-old, right? But it, it should be pretty straightforward. We, we want our congregations to not find our financial um, budget for our congregation to be mysterious. I remember one time I was at a church in the diocese years ago and I said, People aren't going to give if they don't trust that you will handle their money wisely. And the rector said, wow, nobody's going to give here then. I thought, okay, we have some work to do, <laughs> right? But they want to know, are you handling the, the, the gift I give a congregation? I want to know the congregation's not going to squander. So how do, we, how do we create a budget that people can read and understand? How do we make sure that our congregation members have access to that? And, and have explicit um, that, that financial decisions are somehow transmitted. And I don't mean that you write up excruciating details about all of the conversations about uh, in your vestry or bishop's committee around the budget, but how do you provide access to that? And then how do you report um, to the congregation on all aspects of the congregation? How, how is there that transparency in terms of what's going on? When people don't know something, they will make up a story. 
better to have more information. So, but what do we do about giving, right? I know a lot of people, that, that's their main thing. What do we do about giving? How do we get more? Well, first of all, make giving about doing God's work, right? So all of the members of our congregations are part of God's mission for the church, not merely funders of it, right? We don't, we don't want to be just thinking about butts in the pews and money in the plate, which is a crude way of putting it. We really want to say, how are we part of God's mission? And so all giving, we should think about how are we being invited to contribute to the work of God through the life of your congregation? And then how do we put our heart into it? You know, Jesus said, um, actually, where your I, I wrote that wrong, sorry. Where your treasure is, your heart will be. So where where are you putting that? Where is Where's your heart going? Make giving about the mission of your congregation. Be intentional to about invitational to support the work of God through your church. Mission should drive the giving, not the other way around. Right. So, for instance, a simple example: When do you put the treasurer's report in your bishops' committee or vestry meetings? Do you spend twenty minutes at the beginning of a vestry meeting arguing about money and shortchange the conversation about what God is inviting you to do? Or do you put it towards the end? Because mission drives money, not the other way around. Just think about how that works. Um, make giving ongoing and relevant to today. So not every generation can actually think about making a pledge because a pledge is saying, you know, this is what I intend to give for the year. And some people can't financially think a year at a time. If you're struggling, you are not going to want to make a pledge. Right? So think about how you can phrase it um, where people are invited into regular giving or giving to the church without calling it a pledge. Some generations want that language. So you might have to use multiple languages. Um, not everybody uses checks. Some people would say the only check they ever write is to the church. Right? How do you invite people to give in different ways? Not all, not every generation has financial stability. So you need multiple ways of inviting people to give in ways appropriate to their life. For years, I've just set up my bank to give online giving. It works for me. And if you're not figuring out a way other than um, somebody put money into the plate on a Sunday morning for people to give, you are missing out. And, and to think about it in terms of how do you invite people to give in multiple ways. Some will give to a fundraiser and not to a pledge. Some will give to a ministry and not to the overall operating budget. You need to figure out multiple ways. Can't say that enough. You need to be pragmatic. You need to set goals, have a timeline, involve the right people. Communicate and be creative. Communication has changed. Right? It used to be that we had a written newsletter or um, with everybody was in the congregation would stand up and hear it. We, we need a variety of ways to make sure the message is heard and received. We need more than one way. So not just send a letter once a year asking people to give. Um, many of our congregations still do just that. And then lead by example. If I'm going to ask somebody to give, I need to be giving myself. You need to be willing to ask. And don't be afraid to ask frequently and with confidence. You, you need to be, ex and, and part of that is you're inviting people to, to give to something that they say they believe in. Right? So, so allow them that, free, that ability to show that they um, support this work. Be excited about the mission. Absolutely show gratitude. You cannot think enough. And you need to be transparent about finances and giving. If people are confused, if people do not understand the finances of the church, that, that's not going to be a, a way to increase giving at your congregation. Then you need to have a plan. So in terms of year-round year stewardship, you need so what's the year-round calendar? There's a couple places to go. One is project resource, and another. the next slide is going to show you 
how to get there, or TENS, which is the Episcopal Network on Stewardship. Use the material offered. There's lots, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Feel free to reinvent the wheel, but you don't have to. There's really good material offered by a variety of places. If you're gonna have somebody get up and speak, make sure they're actually good at speaking, right? Um, and and by that, I mean, they they know that you don't just get up and speak without thinking about it first. You've actually written something out. Maybe you've even practiced it and you're passionate about it. And you believe what you're gonna say. You cannot over communicate. It's actually impossible to over communicate. You cannot think too much. You need to think a lot. And how you ask will impact how you receive. Again, if you send out the same letter or a variation on the theme that you've sent out for the past five times or 10 times or 20 times, you're going to receive the same amount. And you need to plan and plan and plan. You need to be organizing ahead of September uh, for an annual giving campaign. You need to talk about stewardship before the fall. You can't just wait until the fall to start talking about money, about giving, about the mission of the church, about the ways people can offer themselves as stewards or disciples with everything they have and everything they do. Um, you, you have to really think about how you use that language more than just when you're asking people for a pledge for the year. So some good resources. One of them is the Lake Institute on Faith and Giving. This is a really good place just to get current data and, and demographics and resources on how different generations give, what are the ways people give, the things to think about. Um, they, they just have great resources. The Episcopal Network on Stewardship, um, that's TENS, right? Um, our password in 2024 is Ephesians 5, colon 2, no spaces between any of that. That gets you all of the TENS material. And they have a, here's what you do in January. Here's what you do in February. Here's what you do in March. Here's the program you can use in the fall. They have everything laid out for you. Project Resource um, is another source that, it's again, it's an Episcopal source that's through um, Episcopal Church Foundation. And if you go to Episcopal Resource or projectresource.org slash annual giving, you'll get again, here is what you need to do. Here's the time frame. Here's what you need. Here's how to do it. So really good resources so that you're not trying to come up with something on your own at the end of summer. Um, if that's the first time you thought about it. All right, that was a lot. So I'm going to stop and take questions and stop sharing. And see what questions people might have. Now that I'm back on, I might be able to see some of the chat. Did anything um, strike you as new or interesting or um, challenging for you? I appreciate knowing uh, that focusing on discipleship is uh, the most effective. Obviously, it is for other reasons as well, but that it stimulates giving. I didn't know that. Yeah, and, and again, this the slide that this I wanted to really make sure there's some nuance on is if you focus on giving, giving goes down. And part of that is, again, attitude, intentions, what's the main thing? So if you've never asked people specifically for money, asking people for money, you will get a bump, right? But if that's your only focus, then eventually giving goes down. Jan. Well, I think you had it right that it's where your heart is. There your treasure will be. People need to know and be passionate and about the work that, 
the 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 mission of their church and if their heart is in it they will support it as best they can so i really do think you had it right i might have had it right but it's not the way jesus said it so well maybe they just got it they copied it down wrong you know <laughs> i think that the caution that jesus gives us is if i'm giving a lot of money to something then my heart is in fact probably there so to, to ask myself you know, to look at my checkbook, to say, where is my money going? Right? What am I giving to? It, the, the, sometimes people will say that your checkbook is your moral document. Right? So what do you believe in? Uh, now, obviously, I'm using the word checkbook in a broader term. But, yeah, it's, it's that question of, am I putting... Um, it's a, I think Jesus cautions us. I think, Jen, you're right. We need to be passionate about our congregation and our mission. And if we are, then we need to help and invite them into supporting that. Uh, Glenda. I know I my discretionary fund, my diaconal discretionary fund, gets a big bump when I have the opportunity to tell people how many people I was able to shelter, how many children I was able to send to camp, how many folks I was able to get food when they had no food and if you're really transparent about talking about those things that touches people heart people's heart especially when children are involved and and the congregation will support those things but you have to let them know what you're doing with the money that they give to you yeah. Yeah. give me It was challenging for me to hear about, and, and it's, it's stuff I've heard before, so that's not the challenge, but just as, as Glenda was sharing like that, um, asking people to give to specific things, asking people to give to a specific project and, and people resonate with that. And I have seen that in many, many congregations um, that I've served or been connected with in some shape, form or fashion. So I understand that part. The challenge was um, that it, for those of us who work at creating a budget for the coming year, which is about mission, but in a relatively small congregation that is um, running really, really fine to the, you know, what, what we expect to come in, it can be very difficult to create a budget that's realistic, um, in terms of what's going to be coming in when we're going to raise money for a specific project that actually needs to happen in the coming year or a specific ministry, um, that that's going to happen. So, so it was a challenge to, um to to figure out to think about how to figure out the balancing of wanting to know what's going to come in and yet recognizing that people don't um give in the way they used to and they're going to give to projects which can't necessarily be budgeted for or we don't know what people are going to be committing financially to for the coming year does this make sense what i'm saying that this is a this is a challenge and I, and I think this is where, especially for most of our congregations, where much of our budget is going to be centered around buildings and people. Helping people see that our buildings and our people enable us to do the mission God is inviting us into. And that without the buildings and the people, actually we're not able to do the mission God is inviting us into. And there are going to be folks out there that say, we would just sell our buildings, everything would be great. But that's actually not necessarily true. Right? The buildings enable the mission of the church. The staff enables the mission of the church. And, and so it, figuring out how to tell that story. And that's we've talked in the past about a narrative budget or how to show a narrative budget or invite the stories around that. Um, and at the same time, knowing different generations need different ways of, of having that introduced 
So, Mike. Yeah, one of the things that's important that uh, I found over the years is the narrative budget, uh, setting that up and calling that uh, not only a narrative budget, but a ministry spending plan instead of a budget. Mm -hmm. Because you're not giving to turn the lights on or to keep the lights on. You're doing, you're giving to the narrative budget, which is the story, like Linda was saying, the story of what happens with the resources. And they don't have to be financial. The resources can be the giftedness of the people. They're working in the community. What happens? How does that change? So using the terms ministry spending plan, narrative budget, which tells a story, and we all get those through the Heart Foundation and the Cancer Society. We get their stories in the pamphlets as to what they're doing and how they're changing lives. So if we can incorporate that into the church, a narrative budget and a ministry spending plan, there's our connection with discipleship, there's our connection with proportionate giving, and we're giving to anything, anything that's making a difference in the community where we have the giftedness to do that. So uh, I've, I've found too that it's hard to give to keep the lights on, but it's easy to give to make a difference. Yeah, and, and we do need to say, actually, we need to keep the lights on. Both and, absolutely. Because I, I find here what resonates is that we strive to see our building not only as a place where we gather and worship and learn and serve, but we're a community resource. So we have all kinds of community groups who use this building. We don't charge rent. We do say if you want to contribute to help us keep the lights on, we'll be glad to receive it, but we don't charge rent. And so we have a few groups that come in and use that space and don't, you know, don't contribute or don't contribute much, but enough do that it's a part of our budget. And that's something the congregation is proud of to say that we're a place where folks can meet and th they want to keep those lights on too. So it, it is part of the mission of the church to be a witness to the love of God and an open-hearted community who lets folks come. That matters. Well, and Jane, I think about the witness of all saints where you provided, you know, it started last year, a, a, a warming shelter. Mm -hmm. People say to your congregation, heat is actually necessary. Mm -hmm. oh, so hang the heat bill matters because this is what we do. Jan. Yeah, yeah. Uh, working, learning how to to do a narrative budget, I think, is a great exploration of of what is going on. I I used to include the parish administrator who answers the phone. That mm -hmm. is part of the pastoral piece of the budget because she's the first responder when we get a call. Uh, back in the day when I when I was there, and makes the decision about where that call goes. And if no one is available that minute, does a fabulous job of talking to the people. She is part of the pastoral care. And so when you start looking at, at your, your salaries and your budgets and things like that, the story unfolds of what people really actually do. And, and a lot of people haven't thought of it that way. That, that, you know, how does she spend her time helping people who call in need? Hmm. And I think that you'll use the phrase there, Jan, that, that I think is really important. The story unfolds. How do we unfold the story of our congregation in a way that invites greater discipleship, greater participation, right? greater engagement? And how do we tell that story? So let me just, um, in the little bit of time we have left, at the gathering day, April 13th, in our various and sundry um, regions, one of the things we've invited you to do, and we put this out and hopefully you've seen it, is to come with a story of your of a ministry in your congregation. Think about the way we tell our stories makes a difference. The stories we choose to tell makes a difference. And so I invite you to really think about a story you will tell at your gathering day that helps say who you are, right? That maybe then you could use in terms of um, your your year-round stewardship. 
your way of thinking about uh, why somebody would participate and, and be a disciple through the work of your church. So really encourage you to think about that. Because as the story unfolds, people are invited into that story and to participate more and more in that story. So this was kind of a, a 10,000 or 20,000 foot level. It was not the do X and then Y and then Z, um, but it is an important way to be reminded that if we're gonna take seriously that stewardship is about what we do with what we have as followers of Jesus Christ, then stewardship is way more than just an annual giving pledge drive in the fall or asking people to, to contribute to a budget or it's, 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 we need to, but, and money matters. Jesus talked about money way more than he talked about almost many, many other things. So helping people to be able to see their relationship with money through the eyes of a steward is actually a real gift. In a capitalistic society, it says you are defined by your possessions and how wealthy you are. Um, helping people grow in their life of discipleship as stewards is a transformational act. I'll, I'll end my um, sermonizing with that. Next month, it is the Thursday of Easter week. It's um, Easter is March 31st, first Thursday of April is the I think that's the fourth. Um, Ken and Andrea Farley will be talking about evangelism. Evangelism is a necess is a natural outgrowth of actually of our stewardship. Uh, we we follow Jesus Christ as disciples. Part of what God invites us to do is invite others into this life of discipleship and stewardship. So we'll be talking about evangelism. Every congregation says they want to grow. Very few congregations are comfortable uh, with engaging in evangelism. And yet, we do it all the time with other things. So come uh, experience Evangelism 101 in, in the April Thursday Zoom. And with that, if there's anything else for the good of the order, I want the uh, cohort congregations to please stay on, but um, I hope you all have a great end of Lent, a very glorious Holy Week in Easter. And we will see you in April. Thank you, Bishop. Welcome. Cohort congregations, Bishop? Yeah, they know who they are. Okay. Then I'm out of here. Have a good evening. <laughs>
and you want them to be a part of it. That's another way to put it. Right. Bishop, I'd like to add something um, for us on the Valley. We're going to, I believe we, we are at the last vestry meeting we discussed Instead of having one annual meeting, we we have um, still have our annual meeting, but about every three months we'd have gatherings. Uh, and what did we call them? Or we haven't come up with a name, but uh, to keep things like mission and vision and and finances in front of people and let people be um, made aware and invite them to be partners as, as much as they want to or can be. Um, yeah. On complete transparency. Yeah, it's interesting. So I, I heard about a congregation back East that um, stopped doing an annual pledge drive. They started doing exactly that. Every quarter they had a a parish meeting and they talked about where they were in terms of their their um, finances they talked about where they were in terms of their mission and ministry they talked about formation opportunities they had conversations about worship and they just were really you know this is who we are this is what we do and invited people to participate and by doing that frequently um, nobody was actually asked to make a yearly pledge but everybody was asked to commit for, you know at this point in time and it did make the vestry members very nervous. Like, how are we supposed to create a budget? But what they discovered was uh, giving stayed the same and went up. So, but people then started feeling more involved, more connected, because they knew what was going on. And I wonder about uh, what you were saying, Scott, and what happened there, Bishop, with respect to clarity about mission and values, because without that clarity, those could just be random conversations, right? Uh, whereas with the clarity, and you know, this is what we covered last month too, This the idea of being really clear about a relevant, current, vibrant mission will help with all of that. Yeah, so Caroline, I, I know um, I turn part of this back over to you, of what happens in this next half hours, sharing about what folks have done over the past month. So can I turn this part back over to you, Caroline? <laughs> sure. I mean, we could keep going on what people are taking from this if we want to spend a few more minutes on that, but I definitely want to spend some time hearing. I'm most interested in how the conversation in February might connect to this idea of year-round stewardship. And I think Scott's example and that story about the East Coast are great in helping us think about that. How do we not have these be individual topics that we explore for an hour a month, but rather recognize the way they interact and support one another? Because you can't do effective year-round stewardship if you don't actually have clarity about a relevant, current, meaningful mission. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm happy to take it over, but I also would like to then just say others who have been, you know, when you were working with this over the last month and or reflecting on what you heard tonight from the Bishop, how is this for you resonating in terms of your next steps in your congregation for making that connection. Can I add something? Um, the the slide you you showed us tonight on stewardship, everything we do, every with everything we have, once we say we believe with our time, talent and treasure on behalf of the owner, a complete way of thinking and acting. I, I'm gonna see if we can take that to Richard. He makes our posters, he's our photographer and he does a great job 
and see if we can get a couple made to put up in our church. And then maybe um, try to hit that. I mean, that, that really hits home to me on what stewardship is. We've talked about stewardship, but no one's ever delved into it before at all. Did I remember? I'm sure they have. And I was probably looking at my phone, seeing what the score of the Gonzaga game was or, or something. Um, and, and, and maybe having one of our preachers or a couple of them um, see what they can do with that. But I, I think that's really, really powerful and a great way to start where we're going to go. I guess, Scott, I would suggest thinking about including in that your mission. For sure. Yeah, on, on that same sort of idea that if this is your mission, this is stewardship relative to that mission and our lives as disciples. Yeah, thank you for that. That's uh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts or responses of how you see this connecting to the work that you're doing on mission that you were invited to do last month? Well, this is Andrew from when actually we're in a little bit of a different spot because uh, we're in a search process and um, I've been very clear with the congregation that we have a budget, but there isn't a penny in there for a priest's uh, compensation. So in parallel with the search process, we're going to have to develop financial capacity. And uh, and I think that that means talking about values and priorities. And so our organ is on the fritz. And uh, I honestly use that at an all congregation meeting to have a conversation about values and priorities around that within the context of mission, one part of which is worship, mm -hmm. because I wanted to get the congregation to practice talking about values and priorities in that way. And it involves saying things like, we may not be able to repair the organ, um, or it may be very expensive. How important is that, you know, again, to our worship? And, and, we, and the funny thing is we have the money we have the capital funds to fix it, but I wanted to have that conversation because I don't see how we're going to develop the financial capacity to hire somebody unless we get to that level all the time. And so this, this is the, um, the all the time <laughs> aspect of this presentation was very important to me. Mm. Well, I think one one tie in at um, St. Paul's is the storytelling, which we did, I think, a fairly good job at. Um, and we haven't tied it into um, the budget and giving and how we collect money and spend money. But um, I think it, it's heightened people's sense of um, God's presence and um, our work is as disciples, although we don't necessarily use that word a lot, but the storytelling I think is well received, mm -hmm. uh, you know. And I'm hearing you say, Rick, that it may be a, a foundation mm -hmm. for some of these additional topics and conversations. Yeah, make the connections. <clears throat> I think going back, um, some of what that, what Kevin said in terms of storytelling is how do we also be willing to tell stories about about the financial side of things? I remember as a rector where a person joined the vestry and was shocked to discover for the first time actually where the money came from for the church. She, she didn't seem to realize that actually it came from people's giving. And she, had, and she had been an active part of congregations before. She said nobody ever really talked about where the money for the just running of the congregation came from. And I can tell you that her pledge went way up because she said that. <laughs> she said, I need to give more. 
But I think sometimes there's this mystery to huh. boarding school. Can we create a budget that a 12 year old could understand? And that might not be the same budget that the finance person uses, but how do we create a budget that people can look at and see and understand? And then share it transparently. Right, right. And, and tell the story of it in a way that a 12 year old could understand. That's important. Yeah. And, and putting it in the context of the mission that God is inviting you into, but keep tying that back into why do we do this? Bishop, is there something specific you want the teams to work on over the next month before we get back together? Yeah, I really want you to look at how you have done um, the request for people to financially support the work of the church, the work of God through the ministry of the church. Um, and, and is there something in this session that, that you go, okay, we need to really focus on X, Y, or Z as opposed to where we've always done it? Because we did in, in the fall, we did a quick, okay, let's talk about how you do an annual giving campaign because we were in September. But now we're really saying, how do you expand this? How do you not just, it's not just about money, but it is about money, right? And how do we invite people into um, having a relationship with money that is a relationship as a disciple? And how do we acknowledge that not everybody is in the same place? And I want to just tell a, a, a story um, from my own family. I have an aunt who tithes. Very generous giver, never makes a pledge. She never makes a pledge because when she was, um, it was like in 1972, uh, my uncle had, um, he needed open heart surgery. And that was considered experimental at the time. Insurance wouldn't pay for it. And so huge medical bills. And she, they, they didn't, they had nothing. And the treasurer of the church came to their door and said, you made a pledge, you have to fulfill it. As opposed to the treasurer coming and saying, how can we help you? And they sold their washer and dryer and she used an old fashioned wringer washer for a number of years. And she's never pledged again, but she tithes. And I, when I heard this story, I said, I, would, I don't think I would have given again, right? And so really saying, it's not just about how do we invite people to give it's really about how do we invite people to have a healthy relationship with their finances where sometimes we are supporting people but everyone's invited to give for the support of all right and for the mission and ministry of the, of the church so helping people with that financial literacy piece that financial health piece actually matters and, and again I, I don't hear very many physical churches saying that because i think there's this mystique that everybody has money and we don't talk about money. So I just want you to be aware of that as a reality. If people feel like they can't pledge because it's not another thing, the first church I was an assistant rector at when I was newly ordained, the expectation of the vestry was that if there is a deficit budget in December, individual vestry members will make it up. But only very wealthy people serve non vestry and they didn't make a pledge because they knew they would have to give at the end of the year. That is not a healthy way of doing this, right? So I want you to really take seriously, look at what you've done and look and, and say, how does this work with year round stewardship and really a steward's attitude, which is different from a giving to an annual budget attitude. And I, and I would also say the original tool we gave you of the money autobiography, whether individual or congregational, now is the time to pull that out. Now is the time to be inviting people to explore that and talk about it and recognizing people's own histories and relationships with money will inevitably shape how they receive your invitation and how they think about what you are doing with what they give. Yeah, uh, can I say something here real quick? 
Yeah, Kevin. Okay. okay, so I, I, something just occurred to me, and I've just had this little, I don't know, maybe it's a light bulb that went off here in my head there, uh, uh, but uh, an idea uh, based on what you were, we were talking about earlier, what you presented earlier, um, the notion of maybe during our just an informal coffee hour after after service is over, most of the congregants gather in the, in the fireside room and talk and visit and stuff, and maybe having just an informal discussion about how we save, just start off with something simple, like how do we save money? What, how do we save money? And I could say, well, I, I put, you know, I rabbit X amount of this money away here over there and, and or I don't save very well or somebody, somebody who might be strapped financially, you know, you'd be surprised that people that are really, really hard up for cash are actually pretty, sometimes pretty good at saving money. Um, and just getting that discussion going, something, something that would be easy for people to talk about, and then you can work on maybe the more challenging topics down the road. I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. But would that be a good idea, or would that be not such a good idea? I think the more you can demystify conversations around money, and the more you can normalize conversations around money, um, you got to be careful with how you approach it. But right. And, and I think your instinct, Kevin, about having it be, how do you save money? Questions like, how did you learn about saving money? What were the messages your parents had? What did you right. learn from them? And then how do you do it now? So that it's it's a story about a person's life told through a lens of their relationship with a certain aspect of money. Right. Yeah, I think that's, that's a good instinct. Right. Yeah. Thank you. What, what would you hope your grandchildren learn about money that perhaps you wish you had known at their age? You know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. Taking a lead from the prompt uh, that stewardship is not about um, the money we give once a year to the church or once a month or month, once or whatever to the church, but rather that stewardship is everything we do with everything we have um, in response to our our faith. Um, is this not my starting point on the topic of stewardship from my 20s on, but something I'd it dawned on me over the course of <laughs> preaching on stewardship. Um, stewardship for me encompasses why um, I've given blood every time I've been eligible since since every time I've been eligible to give blood because my, until recently, since I've had some health challenges, but until recently, um, my good health has been, um, has been a gift that I didn't, that, that I didn't, earn or create or make for myself but as a gift from god so if, if my good health is a gift from god then how do, how do i respond um with my good health but maybe give um a pint of blood whenever i'm eligible so that someone else may share in that gift that god has given me so that's not at all about money it's not at all about the church but how i respond to um to being um the recipient of God's gracious gifts. And Bill, one of the things that I really love about that example in your story is it's about how your faith is at work in your daily life. And that is really truly about whole life stewardship, whole life discipleship. It's not specifically about the church, but it's about your faith at, in action for the well-being of God's beloved. Which is, which is what we're called into that a church can help to mediate and to help us to grow into. So that's a, a beautiful way to make that connection. Anyone else? Are you equipped to go out and work with this over the next several weeks and think about this in your congregation and how you can make use of it 
in advance of, oh my goodness, it's the fall and we think it's time to do a pledge campaign or invite people to an estimate of giving. Um, and, and let's acknowledge the reality that between now and the next one is the rest of Lent, Holy Week, and Easter, right? But I think thinking about um, the, the, the life that Jesus stewarded and the fact that how do we how do we have a Jesus shaped life? And, and thinking about that in terms of our own stewardship of our life, this time is not a bad time for us to be doing. And I have one reminder for all of you, just because the bishop, for some reason, what you just said prompted me to think of it. June first. We are scheduled to meet in person in Moses Lake again. That's our assumption is that is where it'll be. We will let you know if it's a different place. Um, but it will be a time for us to pull this all together in conversation with one another and reflect on how all the pieces we've been working with connect to one another and inform our lives as disciples of Jesus. Can you repeat that date, Caroline? June 1st. Okay. Oh, yeah, I got it. <laughs> Just oh, good. It was on my calendar, uh, and I went to the 8th and didn't see it, so I panicked. <laughs> it's the 1st. Okay. And, and I would be curious to know how the work went um, this, over the last month on sort of your mission. Oh, that's gone. Anyone have some specific examples of what you've been doing? Uh, well, I don't want to try to think. I feel like that awkward moment of silence there was just a little overpowering. Um, I could say that... Um, uh, we well we 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 hammered out our budget. We signed off on it uh, the month, but no, last last month we 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 had a meeting and uh, um, on top of the regular you know committee meetings and and we put it together and we've been you know it's planned out and it's we're sticking to it and it's it's pretty. That's, I think a twelve year old could understand it. I mean, I can understand it. So that that's that says something. <laughs> um, honestly. Uh, <laughs> But um, you know, we we got we have a, one little challenge right now that we're having to deal with at the, the church and unexpected expense. Even though we have insurance, I'm sure there's going to be a deductible. We had a little bit of vandalism occur. You know that I guess that sort of thing is going to happen now and again, unfortunately. But that's how it is. Um, but you know, we're we're coping with things, making it happen. That's I don't know. That's not specific enough. But that's all. That's all I can say right now. At that. Well, I know, for instance, that, that last time, um, one of the comments, Andrew, you made was that you thought you needed to really go back and look at the mission statement of, of St. Luke's and say, does this actually reflect who we are? I'm just wondering whether you've had a chance to, to do that work or, or have that conversation. Mm -hmm. I have been thinking about it and I've been looking at it and, uh, but that's, We've we've had a lot of stuff going on. We've had we've had to provide a lot of pastoral care in the last month and um, to people. So I've been thinking about it mostly so that I I could figure out how to have conversation or how to have exercises uh, with it. I personally think it's pretty good, but I do understand that the conversation is valuable. <clears throat> so thinking about it in terms of how to have those conversations, that's a great. Um, way you could use um, Bill who is supposed to be helping you with that. So never hesitate to reach out. Has Spokane Valley done any reflecting on your mission statement? 
since the last time or do you have plans for that uh, we haven't yet um it's going to come up at the next vestry meeting what we did do um last weekend was we sat down as a vestry and we planned the year mm. so that we didn't have to go oh crap it's coming up in two weeks what are we going to do so we did we planned as many things as we knew needed to be done the things that we wanted to do um yeah uh, i feel real comf real comfortable with our calendar for the next for this for 220 of 2024 um there's still some holes in it um but we'll fill those in but i i think we've got a real handle on what we have to do and when we have to do it Excellent. So in terms of St. Paul's, you know, we uh, elected a new vestry on uh, the first Sunday in February, and that vestry had a work working retreat on the 10th, which was after last month's meeting. But we were focusing on the formation of the committee and looking, you know, at the past and at the year. So we did not uh, spend any time on, uh, you know, our mission. We just, it felt like there, there was too much more uh, to do and elect, uh, elect the treasure and, you know, and just kind of that basic stuff. And our next Vestra meeting is this Sunday. So we haven't really had a lot of time to be together to work on that. <clears throat> That makes sense. I think as, again, as we come together in June, it's a great time to be sort of being able to bring back how you have incorporated all that we've been offering through these Zooms into your life, knowing that some of it's going to resonate a lot in some places and some won't feel as relevant, but it's all linked. And our goal is to be supporting you and for your consultants to be supporting you in incorporating this into your lives in your congregations so the ways you do what you do there um, well, thank you all very much for your time this evening looking forward to seeing you next time have a very great end of lent holy week and easter between now and Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. I leave. How do I leave?